Uh, it wasn't, but uh, she has her uh, parents and sisters here. So they let us know. Uh, let us go, I mean. Uh, but they, uh, they had many questions and documentation. And we spent about an hour. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it's closed and now Okay. So you have uh, you are off until like January fourth, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Is it like uh, Canada also same weather like Michigan, right? It's like the snow. weather is the same. Yeah. Um, basically, whatever happens in Michigan, it comes here after an hour or so. So if you have a snow, they will get their share. Yeah. Um, so do I also supposed to basically uh, present with me, but I think this is very like new um, topics. So oh. yeah, so I mean, as I have a little bit of experience with that, so, you know, and I had to work actually for throughout the week because everybody was off. So some research work needs to be done from my work. So I, um, you know, sh she said probably she will see how it goes today and gain some, you know, like things, and then she'll probably add something at the end. Okay, so I just want to make sure, should I add? She's not here yet, but I will add her as a co-host if she wants to add some on her sure. screen. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. I think we can, uh, if everyone is ready, we can start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> today's topics is the role of artificial intelligence in healthcare. Uh, so this is very interesting topic. And I uh, basically, uh, as Dr. Nadir sent a link couple, I think couple weeks ago, and there was the AAFP, American Association of Family Physician. They, uh, <clears throat> they have the like virtual conference and I attended that and I found this is interesting. And also I feel like we, as a future healthcare worker, we need to know because this is kind of growing field and modern technology and we have to adopt these things eventually. So that's where my interest is. And uh, through my work, basically I have some experience of artificial intelligence uh, for my research. Uh, so I can share with that also in, uh, at the end. But that's where I got interested and I feel like uh, this is very interesting. <clears throat> so <clears throat> first of all, like uh, what is artificial intelligence? I'm uh, starting from like very beginning. So artificial intelligence is the computer systems that are capable of performing tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as decision making, object detection and solving complex problem and so on. And artificial intelligence has been playing a critical role in industries for decades, but artificial intelligence has only recently begun to take a leading role in healthcare. According to Front and Sylvian, AI systems are projected to be a $6 billion industry by 2021. So, you know, it has like, it, it is a very growing field and I feel it is going to take over the healthcare. So artificial intelligence has been called the stethoscope of the 21 centuries. <clears throat> so what are the chronic health conditions that expected to benefit most from AI, I mean, artificial intelligence and machine learning? So we can see here, diabetes 66%, heart disease 63%, cancer 63%, neurological diseases 56%, and infectious diseases 46%. So we can see here, like what's the role of, let's see like diabetes is a chronic condition and primary care uh, physician has a, you know, like great role to prevent and like, you know, managing this diabetes. 
same with heart disease, same with cancer. Cancer means I think <clears throat> here they're <clears throat> trying to say, excuse me, uh, say like prevention and like screening all those. <clears throat> Neurological diseases such as like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. So those are also geriatric uh, physician kind of like is a part of like uh, primary care. So these are the chronic uh, health condition expected to benefit from artificial intelligence. And it is like we can see like primary, most of the disease condition is related to primary care physician. <clears throat> Now I'm going to discuss about the role of artificial intelligence in a different perspective. Let's say like risk prediction and intervention. So in the USA, hospital cost for potentially preventable condition such as like cancer account for $1 in every $10 of total hospital expenditures. This means that millions of hospitals stays and up to 100 billion a year might be prevented with better risk prediction and intervention in the ambulatory setting. So what AI doing? So AI driven <clears throat> predicted modeling data can now outperform the traditional pre predictive model in forecasting in hospital mortality, 30 days unplanned readmission and prolonged length of stay and all of a patient's final discharge diagnosis. So we can see here that predictive model, let's say patient comes with a heart failure and admitted for the first time. And then by using this artificial intelligence driven predictive model, uh, basically it can detect like, uh, you know, probably the second readmission for heart failure. And like based on the data, it can also detect like how uh, in future for this specific patient, how much he is going to be staying in hospital and also like, you know, discharge diagnosis also. So the second one is <clears throat> this health system and EPIC have created an uh, artificial intelligence using over 1 billion clinical data points to predict patient deterioration with 98, 98% accuracy. So you can see the accuracy rate is so high. So I, I mean, it's also, it can predict the patient deterioration so that's why like people are very you know, interested about this. And I think it's, it's, it's like, it has a future. Barnard Health uh, is using base health AI to predict risks on 100,000 members for 42 health condition in order to lower preventable emergency department visits and hospitalization through primary care interventions. So <clears throat> it is also like 42 health condition and it also, it can prevent it can also decrease the preventable uh, emergency department visits and hospitalizations. Should I proceed? Hello. Okay. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Sami, sorry. No problem. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and what's the role of medical advice and trials? <clears throat> so the role of artificial intelligence in medical advice and trials. So many companies such as like Babylon Health, Health Tip and others company like your MD have developed a artificial intelligence doctors that can provide health advice directly to patients with common symptoms, bring a primary care access for more complex care. And recent researcher reported the diagnostic accuracy compared to human doctors. So uh, here what happened like the, uh, those companies, basically they are developing artificial intelligence doctors, like, uh, you know, they have all the, they collected all the data uh, from the physicians and it will be inserted into this software, uh, that AI uh, software, and it can, uh, that can provide directly, uh, that can provide health advice directly to the patients. And like common symptoms, let's say patient has a fever, you know, like runny nose or like all the viral symptoms. So it can give this like advice and even like chronic condition, let's say obesity, like, you know, how to uh, decrease weight loss and how to like, you know, like prevent pre-diabetic conditions, something like that. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's accuracy, diagnostic accuracy, it seems like comparable to 
human doctors, so which has also a great role. And scientists believe that AI support can be integrated to a team-based care model that make it easier for primary care physicians to manage a patient panel. So, you know, this is like medical advice and trials <coughs> role. The next uh, role is like the role of AI of risk adjusted paneling and resourcing. So risk adjusted paneling can ensure that primary care physicians have adequate time to address the needs of each patient by increasing or decreasing panel sizes based on patient complexity, which can contribute to patient satisfaction and better work-life balance for physicians. Secondly, burnout related turnover may cost US healthcare system tens of billions per year. The lack of established model for risk adjusting panel has led to a potential AI solutions. So here, like, uh, like you know, of course, uh, Dr. Nadir is very familiar with that and knows very well. Any, uh, whatever the primary care, uh, you know, practice, most of the patients have like literally more than 15 diagnoses, which is a, like, you know, it's like from primary care, primary care practices literally from head to toe. So it's like, this is the most common cause of burnout uh, turnover for the US health system, as well as the physicians. So here there is a, so the lack of established model for risk adjusting panel size has lead to potential AI solutions. So here, I think the artificial intelligence has a solution for it. So, and uh, already like at UCSF and EHR, data on healthcare utilizing was <clears throat> applied to train algorithm that are used to weigh panel sizes in primary care. In the future, such models can be used to determine the level of staffing support needed for primary care practices, such as like example, like medical assistant, nurses, advanced practice providers, clinical pharmacists, and social workers, based on the complexity and intensity of care provided. So next a slide is device integration. So what's the role of AI for device integration? So nearly one in four American own a wearable device, such as like pacemaker or like a <clears throat> defibrillator, something like that, that tackles vital signs, that tracks uh, vital signs or other health measures. The wearable device ma market is expected to reach 52 billion by 2022. Primary care physicians may be able to use data from such device to diagnose or treat disease at earlier stages. However, the data share volume and incompatibility with current <laughs> electronic health records makes this unfeasible without the help of artificial intelligence. Apple's HealthKit is an example of a tool that integrates data from multiple wearable devices into the EHR and enabling uh, teams to track trends and spot any deviations that suggest illness. So here, the uh, role of device integration is like, um, uh, you know, like <clears throat> I think it was, uh, it was very hard for the primary care physicians to detect those like, you know, what's the, uh, like let's say a patient has the atrial fibrillation or like supraventive, I mean, PSVT or something. So he's wearing a device or like a wearable device. But uh, by using this uh, data to implement from the EHR, uh, we can detect like what's the second attack. I mean, it can detect like, you know, how, how much chances of second attack of getting of AFib or some like VFib. So, which is, which is feasible, but I mean, it, is, it was unfeasible without the help of artificial intelligence. So what's the role of AI at chart review and documentation? So clinical documentation in the EHR is one of the biggest drivers of physician burnout in the USA, causing as much as like 90 to 140 billion in lost physician time per year. Because we have to like, you know, the physician has to document a lot of information. So it is like, uh, you can see that, you know, it's like literally 90 to 140 billion in lost time per uh, year. So technology companies with expertise in automatic speech recognition are teaming up with the health system, including like Google and Stanford, Microsoft and UPMC to develop a artificial intelligence driving digital scripts that can listen in on patient physician conversations and automatically generate a clinical note. So which is very interesting, I guess, because uh, 
uh, it can basically it can I know uh, it can like detect or it can listen the uh, discussion between physician and patient the conversation and it can automatically generate a clinical note so which will like you know decrease a lot of uh, you know patients uh, <clears throat> like notes and all that time for the physicians. Although still it is in fancy, but this type of AI carries the potential unshakable physicians from the EHR and reduce burnout. What's the role of AI uh, in clinical decision making? So leading EHR supply suppliers, like we all know those companies, like including all scripts, alternal health, Sarnar, eClinical Works, and finally Epic. That's the uh, I think the biggest one, have all announced that plan to add artificial intelligence into their EHR workflows to support doctors in their clinical decision-making. Uh, so the next generation of clinical decision-making platforms must move beyond alerts and the best practice advisories to provide analytics and evidence-based contact in the clinical um, outflow to drive intended actions. So uh, that's the AI. And also eClinical works, like for example, is developing a new version of their EHR that will, that will feature an um, uh, AI assessment that gives users evidence-based clinical suggestion in real time. So from the EHR, it can, uh, I think the artificial intelligence software can uh, read the evidence-based clinical suggestion and based on that, it can provide uh, it can uh, provide the decision, it can help the primary care physician to their clinical decision. How it helps in practice management. So one of the most anticipated applications of AI uh, in medicine is automation of repetitive clerical tasks that are suffocating patients practices. For example, like Olive uses AI to automate things like eligibility checks, insurance claims, prior authorization, appointment reminders, billing, data reporting, and analytics. AI also can be used to automate certain aspects of pre-visit planning to make uh, primary care encounters more efficient and rewarding for patients and physicians. Diagnostics, uh, what are the role of uh, AI in case of like diagnosis? So artificial intelligence powered algorithm for diagnos diagnosing disease is now outperforming physicians in detecting skin cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, brain cancer, and cardiac arrhythmia. So basically those are all uh, like, uh, I mean, anyway, those people, I mean, when we a primary care, when diagnose this cancer, um, they need a referral. They are going to see a, uh, uh, I mean, a specialist, but uh, uh, the role of primary care physician is detect that cancer. So by using this powered algorithm, it can, I mean, basically now it is now outperforming and it is this software is now uh, not only in US, I think all over the world, even India is using this type of uh, software to diagnose cancers. In regions with lack of access to specialty care, these tools in the hands of primary care doctors can provide significant benefit to patients such as like underserved area or like the, the like, you know, like a very rural area where there are no specialty care, at least the diagnosis is possible by using this tool. Tencent's uh, artificial intelligence can spot Parkinson's disease using smartphone videos, promising tool that can expand access to care and empower primary care physicians to broaden the services they can provide to patients. So here, uh, you know, is the role of geriatric patients, I guess, if they can use the, you know, smartphone videos and all that, it can, it has a tool that can promising effect and uh, it can smart spots this disease. Google can accurately predict cardiovascular risks using retinal scans. So, you know, it's using the retinal scans and it can predicting the cardiovascular risks, like let's say it's the risks of heart attack or heart failure or something like that. What's the role of uh, AI in augmenting the patient's physician relationship? The final thing. So AI has the power to protect the pilot from the unsafe destructions of information um, overload by organizing the cacophony of patient's data, evidence-based practice guidelines and compliance, monitoring checkbox into a manageable cockpit for primary care physician. 
There is the emerging evidence that AI, when implemented as a part of human care team, is acceptable to both patients and providers. So a text-based conversation uh, of AI for weight loss had a patient trust and satisfaction score of 87%. So it was a conversation uh, between patient and physician and we just completely text-based and uh, that's done by like an AI tool and for weight loss program. And it seems like, uh, you know, that patient trust and satisfaction score is 87%, which is, a, which is a good score, I guess. And AI-driven diabetic neuropathy screening protocol providing real-time results generated a 96% satisfaction score with 78% of patients preferring the AI model over the usual care. Humanoid robot assistance for medication management have shown a high degree of acceptability, literally 86 to 100%, and with patients across the age spectrum from children with type one diabetes to elderly home care patients. I think there is, here is another role of geriatrics patients as well because I think geriatric patients also have multiple, like, um, uh, uh, you know, like uh, nursing home patients, they have multiple comorbidities also. So it's like a robot, humanoid robot assistance, uh, uh, you know, medication management. So it can tell like, you know, what are the medicine need to take when, something like that. And also, so it's beneficial for the children as well as like elderly home-based, like nursing home patients. Finally, the conclusion. So as uh, everything has pros and cons, uh, it seems to be very interesting and very growing field. Uh, however, as AI becomes the second great wave of technological innovation to offer power and possibility for modern healthcare, of course, a key question is, will AI augment rather than subvert the relationships? or will managing and being managed by AI add yet another technological master and burden to the lives of physicians? I think ongoing research will be needed to determine the impact of AI in achieving the quadruple aim, such as of better care, better health, lower cost, and improved well-being of the workforce. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so that's uh, really interesting. It's uh, a new topic and uh, emerging field, as you said. Um, any comments, any questions, any addition? Roa is with us now. Hello, hi everyone. Thank you, yeah. Sumi, for the presentation. I catch up in the last 15 minutes. It was really good and well organized. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there are a couple of points. Uh, so uh, you did great. The topic itself is kind of uh, interesting because it depends on many factors. One of them is what's the input? Uh, as I say, if you put something bad uh, as trash in, trash out. So you have to figure out how you get the basic information, The things that you will build this uh, AI on uh, supposed to be solid and uh, you take the output and then you reanalyze and go back. Uh, let's take the example you mentioned, fever, runny nose. Nowadays with COVID, you have to be very, very serious about what you're gonna do in the past, you can say that to the patient, hey, just take fluid, stay home, something like that. Uh, with COVID now, uh, the message might be a different one. So artificial intelligence, uh, I think is important in not only developing it, but also re reassessing and improving. And I think that's one of the uh, key point uh, that they are working on getting it improved in different aspects of different fields. But thank you so much, uh, Sumi. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Dr. Nadir. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, uh, that's really important. I mean, that's why in conclusion, I said like it can be a technological innovations, but uh, 
you know, a, we have to know how to managing, manage it. And, uh, you know, the use, we have to know how to use it properly, I guess, like, you know, other than uh, it will be like more risk than benefit. That's, that's right. And the other part is who is behind that? Uh, if it's only um, the developers are only software engineers or dev um, like code developer or programmers, then it will be ending like the EHR, the electronic medical records. Now every physician is heading the medical records because it put burden on them instead of solving problem and make life easier. The promise is that the EHR will talk to each other and make life easy. Uh, documentation will be easier, but it turns out that is not the case. So I hope with AI, it will uh, achieve the promise, not gonna be a burden, another one. Right. I think Lubaba wants to say something. Please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you so much, Somi, for a very interesting topic. Uh, well presented, and uh, as you said, it's the developing field, and uh, it has a lot to take. It's exciting to know that technology can take over soon. Um, I feel like it's going to be the number one competitor for physicians in the future is if it is perfectionized or um, as Dr. Nader mentioned, um, the input of data, if it is correct, uh, with um, accompanied by continuous manage, like maintenance and um, assessing, I think it's going to be a real competitor. But I feel like one of the challenges now for AI is maybe uh, confi confidentiality of the data since we are working with um, personal kind of health um, uh, informations. Um, I think that had been in the past, like many times there is a breach for the electronic medical record and it end up with uh, big lawsuits for the company. So I think this is one of the challenges, but in terms of assisting physicians uh, in the future, if it is uh, well built, I think it's going to be a big assistance, uh, but uh, it's really interesting to see. And as you said, uh, there is a lot of area of research to follow on that. But thank you so much. It's really interesting. I enjoyed it, Max. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Lubaba. That's a good point, actually, in regards to like patient data and like I think you you trying you're trying to say the HIPAA policy and like patient uh, you know like uh, data. I mean that's a very key concern I think for uh, AI. Um, as I uh, as I mentioned, like you know I have some personal experience where I'm doing the research, so. Uh, it's like a, you know, I do like tumor measurement by doing like assessing from the radiological perspective, let's say like CT and MRI using like regular, uh, you know, the radio, all the radiologists, they use a software called PAX. That's a regular software. So I uh, use that software to measure the uh, you know, tumor and put the response. Let's say like, you know, one patient is on clinical trial. So is this patient is like, you know, based on the established criteria by measuring that tumor, like is it patient is stable disease or he's responding or he's progressing? There is some established criteria for that. So we used to do that, but recently there is a, uh, you know, company called Siemens and Philips. Um, so University of Michigan, they uh, actually, they, you know, we went to RS in a meeting and uh, over there, there was a software, it's called artificial intelligence. It was, um, uh, you know, they came to with that idea that instead of using like, let's say I have like three people's, uh, you know, working for that measurement. And then I have to finalize the report based on that measurement that it is a stable disease versus response versus progressive disease. So the, uh, you know, the software will automatically, that artificial software, it can automatically measure that uh, tumor and it can, uh, you know, put that response like, you know, partial uh, response versus stable disease versus progressive disease. So we are in the very primitive stage at this point. Like I'm basically learning now how to use that uh, software, like AI, AI based software. Um, uh, but I feel like, you know, nothing is, I mean, that's my personal opinion though. I mean, you know, there is no alternative for human, uh, you know, human brain. That's what I, uh, I also, when it was 
first uh, implemented in our department. Um, you know, what, the way I felt, uh, there is no alternative for the human because I can, of course, it has a uh, good accuracy as, as far as we have experience. I mean, we are experiencing a good accuracy rate, but still it can, uh, you know, it's, it is not an alternative for human. That's all I can say from my, uh, you know, very um, minimum experience, I would say. Thank you. I, I can't agree more. I think that supports that Dr. Nadi's point that need continuous reassessment. Yeah, things are changing, so we are just placing data, and I think artificial intelligence is going to work with the data we are placed in. If you are not reassessing it, so it's not going to be useful. Thank you so much. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, um, like as I mentioned, you know, it. I mean, we, we let's say there are some target lesions, there are some non-target lesions for the tumor measurement. So I can give you an example. So let's say it's a pancreatic cancer and there are two uh, lesions we are measuring. One is 15 millimeter, one is 20 millimeter. So, you know, in, in the next scan, if it is like more than 20% increase from baseline, it will be automatically progressive disease, right? But the problem is the artificial intelligence, that software data, it can detect only that two specific lesion. It cannot detect when there is a multiple lesions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it will tell like, okay, 20% increase or not, increase or decrease or not, or yes. So it is like PD progressive disease versus stable disease. But it, if there is like, you know, 30 more other lesions, it is not able to predict properly. So where there is a, you know, human brain needed. <laughs> So that's what I'm saying, you know, it, it, uh, I feel, yeah, like, you know, this technology is taking over the world, I felt, yeah, and that is a, like, a very competitor for even the radiologist, like, you know, they are also, like, uh, I mean, you know, I, I work with the radiology and oncology department, so even, like, they are also, uh, like, you know, thinking this software that uh, probably a competitor for them for next, you know, 20 years or so, probably there will be no radiologist, uh, you know, they, they don't have, other than intervention radiology, I think they don't have much interaction with the patient. So a software can read the CT report or MRI report, but, uh, you know, it's never be a, I think, a, I mean, you know, human brain is never be comparable to anything, but of course there is, it is the alternative. That's all I can say. That's a good point. Thank you so much. I think Mulham also wants to say something. Yeah, I would like to say thank you, Sumi, for the presentation. Really, it was impressive. Um, new topic, interesting. Allows to think that about the future. We need to think about the future and the advancement of medicine. And it was interesting to hear about the, that artificial intelligence will be able to aid and treat chronic illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, neurological disease and even infectious disease, something very interesting, really. Thank you for mentioning that point. And even you explained and um, made it very clear, the points. So thank you for that. It's a very enjoyable presentation. And it shows that um, we are only gonna stay a lot in the medicine because technology is taking everything right now. And we need to think about different uh, specialties or fellows. For instance, there is like clinical informatics. I think that's something when you just spoke about AI, I was like, oh, I need to think about clinical informatics. That's something interesting and other fields which has some technology involvement. Thank you for bringing that topic up. It's very interesting. We need to think about it and how we're gonna use technology to prove or provide a better quality of, for patients in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mulham. Thank you, Lubaba, and thank you, Sumi. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please, you can use uh, the raise hand on the chat participant box, or you can jump in. Any addition? Okay, you can uh, ask later or add uh, your comments or uh, anything uh, related to Sumi's presentation. That's a great one, uh, Sumi. Thank you so much for sharing all this information. Um, let's go to the next uh, section. Uh, anything uh, you want to share, guys, about your uh, interview 
experience. Mulham, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, I would like to share with you uh, my last experience for this week. But uh, before that, I would like to explain something that happened uh, in the interview before that. I wasn't able to explain it last week. Probably was upset a bit of what happened. It was uh, a bit of a, um, some form of rudeness or discrimination that happened uh, during the interview. So that's why I wasn't able to explain. But right now, I'll try to make it uh, clear. Because there is something that happened, but um, we don't feel appropriate to say it. But I think it's appropriate to say so that everyone knows that things can happen differently and we need to respond accordingly and it might change uh, the response uh, onwards. So basically what happened is uh, I was in a university, it was a prestigious non-university. I, I went with the mentality I'll be respected and given the time like every interviewer, most of there were American graduates. Anyways, so what happened is um, the interviewer came a bit late. Um, it's okay, they're busy, I understand that, but um, she gave me about five minutes instead of the 15 minutes and she said, you have five minutes and you will be pulled out by the program coordinator. I felt that was a bit rude, but then I was like, okay, I have five minutes, so let's do it. Um, by about three minutes in the interview, she said like, all right, you have two minutes. Just say something here or there about why you're interested about your program and what makes you a good applicant or something. That's when I um, was triggered, frankly, uh, by that. I'm frustrated by the, her response and reaction, but I used that trigger to show her that I'm actually, I'm a good applicant and you did a mistake by what you did uh, by this response. So I did choose, the only way they can understand that we are someone who is knowledgeable or smart is by using big terminologies and um, being very um, structured and using body language. So I used that to the best knowledge I could in two minutes and she changed her response and attitude. And within five minutes, she asked that I return back to the room. And instead of 15 minutes, we ended up ha having 45 minutes of interview. That's what I said last week, but I didn't explain uh, why it was uh, first five minutes. But yeah, because of what I did in the two minutes, she was impressed. She added, kept on adding 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and so on. And that delayed the whole schedule of, the, of that day uh, in the university. Alhamdulillah, uh, I was able to uh, at least feel comfortable with what, what I did, which is being triggered, made me a bit uh, maybe more focused and concentrated on uh, my aim and goal there, which was actually wasn't, I wasn't focused on the interview itself, but more focused on making sure that she understood that I was a good applicant, just like the American graduates. I'm not less than them. And you invited me here. So yeah, that what happened during this interview. And these things can happen during interviews. We need to be careful and not try to be, feel less, but l let them know who we are by the way we speak and the way we interact and being respectful and polite. That's the only way um, they can understand that. So that's what happened in a uh, previous interview. Okay, then uh, for the last interview, uh, nothing really happened much. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it was uh, very well. Um, it was very relaxed. And um, I think only one interviewer went a bit um, too much into detail. He asked me about four questions in uh, what is a mistake that you did? And I just uh, gave him a mistake that I did before. And accordingly, he went like, okay, did the patient have stroke right now? Or previously I said, okay, she had a previous history of stroke. And um, he asked about if we had a, an opportunity to um, fix this issue and prevent it from occurring in the future, do you have a mechanism to prevent that from occurring in the future? So I said the checklist mechanism that I implemented after the mistake that happened. And the mistake itself, it was based on vitals um, assessment and the patient unfortunately developed respiratory failure, uh, intubated, uh, alhamdulillah she was extubated the day after. I explained my mistake to the patient and everything went uh, accordingly. But uh, it was a learning experience. I learned from it a lot. And that's based on uh, what I uh, added is the checklist uh, every time and including what needs to be done and not. And that's what I explained to him and that's what he wanted to hear. Um, then I think he went also into depth about research. Sometimes he would like to know if I provided right now an opportunity to speak about the research, what will you do right now? I, I will give you all the resources. What I want you to choose one topic and just say it. I had this in the last interview. Uh, it is a program that is affiliated with John Hopkins. So they think that they're the best program in the world. Uh, so they said, uh, we are involved in research a lot. 
we like you, but we want to know a research right now. First, initially, I didn't really have something in mind. So I was like, okay, uh, I'll go something based on Himanko. That's something that interests me. So I said, um, breast cancer or prostate cancer topic. No, we want specific. So yeah. Uh, then I was, I was like, okay. Then they went like more detailed. So there I stopped and then I returned to the topic uh, and thank you Dr. Nadi for uh, the um, webinars of Michigan State University. Because one interesting topic that actually interests me is patients who had uh, post COVID or were diagnosed with uh, having negative after being diagnosed with COVID developing some consequence or complications like MI, stroke, DVT and so on. So I use that to explain that that's something that interests me and I wanna do it in the next couple of months if I have the opportunity, because this is something that is happening right now and we need to be um, involved in such a topic. So he was like, yeah, that's an interesting topic and I wanna be involved with you in this topic if you are involved in our respected uh, program here. So yeah, that's uh, just one thing. And I think this is a new question that I haven't seen any of the other inter interviewers and I will be adding it to the um, uh, Google sheet that we have shared together. Then, uh, yeah, one even asked me about what is your plans for New Year Eve? So he was like seeing if I'm a som someone who's social or not and what do you use every year or, or your plans uh, for every year? So uh, what I said is uh, I immediately recalled uh, Ramadan and during Ramadan season or every year, uh, I would hang out uh, with my family and friends. And so I shared the experience of Ramadan there and uh, in New Year Eve position. And he liked that a lot. But, but at the end I said, this year it will be different because of COVID. And yeah. Okay. Then, yeah. Uh, okay. So basically also there's an interview that I got um, I think three weeks ago, um, and I had to reject the program because it's um, it was in the same date. It's okay, Azza. Okay, she said sorry for being late. It's okay. Um, so uh, the program said, um, yeah. So basically, what happened is I sent a letter for interest, and I was invited in the same week by one program. Uh, is it one, yeah, the program uh, had this rudeness about. Uh, anyways, what happened is um, I had to re first initiate to reject them because of, um, I had the same invite in the same date I had another interview. So I didn't know what to do, but I said the best thing to do is being polite. I said I was honored to be invited on this date. And if possible, please provide me another available date. They didn't respond. After three days, I send them again. Uh, thank you for providing me uh, an invite for your prestigious university. Uh, please provide me another invite uh, when it becomes available. And they did. In exactly about two days after, they invited me. After I rejected them. So it's important to recall that they are busy, but we need to be persistent. I think that's very important. If you have, you are being waitlisted, try to make sure you send about every three or four days after. Most probably, if there is any opening, they would provide you. Uh, the invite. So I, I just wanted to share that point because it might be helpful for somebody who's right now is waitlisted. You can easily enter from the waitlist to the invite position by being more active with them, especially the program coordinator. And yeah, uh, for the last week AAMC uh, letter, I think there is a lot of that letter itself. It shows that there's chaos and there's some form of uh, unclear situation that is happening this year. So please, everyone, uh, if you can, next month, try to be more active. I think there'll be more invites because uh, based on the programs, they covered everything. But then again, based on the letter, it seems it is uh, mostly high tire, uh, tire uh, competitive applicants who are having the invites. And at the end of the day, they'll enter into one program and having about 40 or 50 programs uh, or being invited to those programs um, is not a right option for programs. So they know that right now they're in a situation that they need to invite more. And so I think they would invite, I think they'll invite more next month or at least to February because there's still February that is uh, usually empty in most programs. So we need to just be active inshallah next month and we'll be getting more invites. And um, yeah, also one, one thing I wanna share that 
if you are invited, they don't go towards the red flags, for instance, the score. I haven't asked, been asked up to this moment any scores relation. Always they ask me about uh, my academic involvement. They're interested in that part. They're interested in research. They're interested about um, those things, most probably. If that's if they go towards the CV part. And only once, yeah. If you mention any hobby in your CV, you need to make sure that you understand it very well. And I will share two points here. One is mine and the second is my friend. My friend, um, before the application season, he said, Mulham, uh, why not mention philosophy? This is something that interests uh, most programs. It's, it will appear as if you're someone who's very, um, having different thinking process and unique and all that. I told him, well, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, if I say something about, for, for example, Plato, Aristotle, uh, Schopenhauer, or Socrates, they would consider me as someone who's a philosopher and the way I will speak, I would be somewhere a very deep thought process, uh, which they would like to be. Uh, and they would expect when I speak about that, I'm not. I told him, sure, I do read about them a certain level, but I'm not a philosopher. He said, well, I read some of it, so I'll mention it. Now, the big issue here that came that he wrote it there and he went to a program director who has a PhD in philosophy and he's, he took it from John Hopkins. So that's a catastrophe. And yeah, it went bad for him, uh, unfortunately because of the program that I expected to meet someone who's a philosopher, even though he wrote just a book or a couple of things about Plato or something. And yeah, the whole talk, it was, a he expected him to know about Plato, Aristotle, Socrates and all that. And he didn't have the much detail. He just had the bit of uh, the higher up topics and not the details. So anything that we mentioned in our uh, hobbies or interests, they would really go into depth and into it. We need to really know it, not just the brief, anything you mentioned, you are what you said. For instance, uh, I do read sometimes about history. So I wrote about this, uh, um, documentaries. I enjoyed watching documentaries about historic events. So I was asked in one of the interviews that part and I explained it in about three or four minutes. I explained the importance of history and why it's important to me in terms of by understanding the history, we're able to correlate that by uh, understanding our present and the future and its importance of correlation between medicine, history, and uh, power change in the world and politics. And I explain a bit some of the uh, uh, concepts of importance of history in the world. And they enjoyed what they heard because they, they knew that actually I understood the importance of history. And I gave them some examples about the plague uh, and one, of, one book I read about it. Uh, uh, and frankly, I didn't prepare to talk about it as I didn't expect it. But then I was like, okay, if I have a situation, I'll just mention plague. It's a good topic, we are in COVID. And then I related the, the plague with COVID and the change in power that happened in Europe and the world during the plague and uh, the medicine part and the politics part that happened. So there's correlation and this is something that is happening right now, fear of China being number one and all that. So he enjoyed what I, what I was saying. I was like, whoa, that's interesting. Anyways, if we have anything in our uh, hobbies, make sure or any in the CV, make sure you know it very well. Most probably you might be asked during the interview. It might be something that interest, interesting to them and you might speak for three, five or more. And I think that's the whole things here I have. And if you have any questions, please ask me. Thank you and good luck. Thank you so much, Mulham, um, for sharing. And um, these are really nice, uh, great tips. Uh, thanks for sharing. Anyone else uh, wants to share or ask or comment? Go ahead, Omnia. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, uh, first of all, I did uh, one interview two weeks back. Uh, this one, it was a university affiliated program in uh, Illinois. Uh, it went well, actually. The structure of the of the interview was we attended a full day with them. We started with their morning report and. They asked all the candidates to ask questions. So uh, we started asking the resident. And at that time, we get the attention of the uh, program director. And he started asking the candidates, why are you asking this question? What are you thinking uh, like that? So by the time we went into our personal interviews, which was 15 minutes, uh, I felt that they already got a good impression. 
And uh, they clearly, after the end of the interview, they told me that we will rank you high. Please con consider us. We think that you are a good candidate, which was very, very, although it was not my top program, but uh, I'm kind of reassured after this uh, comment from the uh, program director. So this one uh, went well. And I think whenever they ask you to, uh, um, whenever you attend educational activity, don't hesitate to ask questions. This will, but yeah, be polite, don't squeeze the residents, but do ask questions. I felt this is what went well in my, my interview. Uh, the second interview, uh, they were very nice program, but uh, the issue was that the program director was Arabic speaker. And he started, um, and actually, unfortunately, he was a Sudanese as well, and he, starting, uh, he started talking in Arabic, which, to be honest, was very, very, very disturbing to me. He tried to be nice, but I felt that I'm one of the 400 applicants for him. But this is my second interview. I need this. I need it to go uh, the right way. So I got mixed signals. Uh, does he really like me? He will rank me or this is just was a chit chat about Sudan revolution. When was the last time you visited? I felt my whole CV was just disregarded. And the second faculty they put me with uh, is a person who never rounded in the floor. Uh, she doesn't know the residents. She asked me, how did you know about the program? I told her like, uh, I know a few residents from my hospital. I have eight residents from Hamad in this program. So she said, uh, okay, anyway, I don't know anybody and I can't ask you the names because to be honest, I'm here only for three months. Do you have any question for me? And then I asked her a few questions. You know what? Um, I don't know about the research structure. I don't know if this program is doing research or no. Uh, I think you can save this program, for, uh, this question for the program director. The one who was chit chatting about Sudan. It was extremely strange interview, to be honest. And I wish nobody of you guys uh, experienced this. Because I am Arabic speaker from my side, I would never speak Arabic or mention Sudan, even if I know that you're, you're Sudanese or maybe just casually, but asking me, where are you from? Your family is from Umdurman, where from Umdurman? I, I felt this was too much. <laughs> but just try to keep calm and answer. I don't know, maybe Mulham can help, I don't know. I answered him in, in Arabic and I went with the flow, but I was extremely uncomfortable. I didn't like it. Uh, in this case, I tried to cut the story short, but I couldn't. I tried to redirect him asking about my CV, asking questions about the program, but he insisted uh, asking about Sudan and speaking in Arabic. So I, 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 I don't know how to, to manage this in case it happens in the future. So that's all about my two interviews. Okay, I would like to say uh, first congrats for the second interview. Inshallah, it will all go well. Uh, we can't really know that uh, what is right or is wrong. And um, frankly, I'll say that there's some interviews that told me clearly will rank you high, but there's this, it's a big game that uh, we can't really tell. Sometimes they say that because we are the ones who can play here. We are the ones who say who ranks first, second, third, and fourth. So they know that. So that's why sometimes when they see a competitive applicant, which they may place in the top 50 or top 100, they would say, I'll rank you high. But is that sufficient for us to be matched? Nobody can tell really. It depends on the other applicants who they would mention higher up. Maybe, maybe we are higher up. I'm not trying to discourage you there, uh, but don't place the ranking when, you, when it comes based on what they said, but based on what you feel is better for you and your future and dreams. Um, so inshallah, you'll have also more interviews uh, in the next couple of days. And based on it, you'll be able to say what it comes first based on that, not based on what you felt on even the uh, Sudanese uh, interviewer. I had one similar interview that it changed. It was just a talk. I didn't feel it's an interview. 
uh, it was in a university, some interviews in university or affiliated universities, they like to have a talk uh, and just to know you. Are you social? Are you someone who's fun to hang out or speak out with? That's how they see uh, the future in terms of uh, if you're presenting a case or so on, then after that case, are you someone who's fun to talk? Sometimes some programs do that. So I had that experience in one or two interviews. So that's okay. Um, don't think too much about it. You did your best. That's the most important thing. You tried to focus them on your CV, but they, they were not interested in it. They were interested in a talk. So that differed from one interview to another. And I think you did very well. And it shall be uh, a great experience and something that you see in the future and laugh about it because you did well and good luck. Uh, thank you, Mbatam. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Omnia and Mulham, for sharing uh, your experience. Sorry, Azza, I spoke. I saw your hand up. Uh, thank you so much. Um, regarding your interview with the, the Arabic speaker um, program director. Um, I think as Moham said, some programs like trying to see your social aspect, maybe he went further asking about, he felt like there is a connection, like you are, he's Sudanese and you are Sudanese and he went further asking about that. But I don't, um, I think, I think American grads are, when they came across people they know they do the same in somehow. So don't be disturbed by it, as Mulham said. And um, uh, if I were you, I would continue speaking English. Uh, this is my opinion. So just like to, yeah, maybe, yeah, we will feel comfortable when we find somebody speak our mother language and then feel like it's easier to communicate that way. But in setting of professional interview, I will continue speaking English. This is my opinion, but congratulations. Maybe we lost Dr. Nadir for some issue. Ali, if you have. Oh, am I disconnected? Do you hello? Do you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm yes, not sure. I think Dr. Nadir is not there. Something, something happened. Yeah, so we can continue with the meeting and yeah. join us. Yeah. I think Azza, you were raising your hand. You can go ahead. Oh uh, yes. Yeah. How are you guys? Um, I'm sorry for being late again. Uh, thank you, Mulham, for the input and Omnia. Um, congratulations and and I think your interview. You said that it's it, you, they give you mixed signals, but um, sometimes, as Lubaba said, he sees a, the program director. Maybe he sees a familiar face and he wants to chit chat for a while. And uh, and I think um, your your uh, your opinion about the program. Uh, and and how this would affect you ranking them, uh, that would matter. And how is your fellows think about the program? How they are? You said eight of them. They are already in the program. How the how is the imp, how is the setting of the program, and how they perceive the the program director? And that's a lot of information that I think you already have. So. Uh, I uh, don't get the impression uh, of him talking in Arabic uh, affect you that much. Uh, maybe he was just uh, being friendly or sometimes he, he want to break the ice with you. And uh, yes, as, as Lubaba said, uh, I would continue talking in English if, he, if, he, if, he, uh, if the program director starts talking in Arabic, I would continue talking in English. Uh, but uh, anyways, you just have to look to the other parts other than the interview. 
how the program, how is your fellows doing there, how they're everything going with them, and how, how would they recommend you ranking the program? This is another important thing. And just wish you luck. Sometimes the first impression are, are not right at all. <laughs> so just wish you the best of luck. Um, hi everyone. Uh, so, as uh, the Baba said, I think uh, the kernel has lost connection. So we can continue um, until he reconnects again. So, um, does anyone have uh, anything to add or I think any he's experience back. to share? I think the Tornado is back, uh, Khaled. No, sorry about oh. that. <laughs> yeah. Am I? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. So thank you, Lubaba and Aza, and thank you, Omnia, for sharing. Uh, any addition, uh, Marwa, Rua, uh, you are raising your hands. Go ahead, one of you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, well, first of all, I apologize for for um, joining late. Um, I would like to thank Sumi first for the great presentation. I really like the topic, although I just joined maybe for the last part, but it's something that's really interesting. And I just wanted to thank her and say Merry Christmas. Um, I think she's celebrating Christmas, so Merry Christmas. Uh, the other thing, um, I would like to thank um, Mulham for the really nice tips and um, Omnia as well. And I just, just want maybe one comment for uh, Omnia. Um, I know it can be like, maybe it wasn't like maybe uh, so professional, maybe turning the, the, the uh, maybe changing the language and everything and maybe the extent of questions, but this can happen even with like, yeah, with American um, interviewers. So like, for example, I was interviewed uh, in a program like, like the the interviewer who's American, he asked me about like Sudanese. He brought up Sudanese. Um, he knew that I'm I'm from Sudan. He um, asked me by like called me by, by by my first name and I like asked like about do you know Munuhia, like a famous Sudanese dish or something. And like he was asking me where do I live and like do you use this like the R train in Bay region and like like I've been there. There are a couple of restaurants. So it like don't feel like maybe intimidated or anything. They already have uh, their your resume and the fact that they didn't ask you much doesn't mean that um, this is like a bad thing. Maybe they already know that you are qualified and being maybe from Hamad, they already are familiar with residents from there and they know how they, well they do. So that like, maybe he felt there is no need to just go into like specifically into things. He just wanted, as everyone said, to break the eyes, even if though they might not be uh, sound uh, so professional, but other maybe uh, even American uh, interviewers might do the same thing. So it's like, I was asked just one question related to the whole interview thing and the rest of it was just chatting about other stuff. So this is perfectly fine. And I wish you um, all the best. I thank you. Thank you, Marwa. And uh, I totally agree with Marwa is uh, you don't take it uh, negatively uh, sometimes you look at it and they put you on a list and then they select you for interview. That's by itself, it's a, a big positive thing. So when they talk to you guys, I think it's it's just a matter of formality sometimes. Uh, maybe they already uh, knew many things about you. They don't wanna add any, as Marwa said. Uh, sometimes they need to break the ice if they uh, feel that you a little bit stressed about the interview itself. So if they knew something about you or hobbies or language or region or something, then they can use that as a way to calm you down. But in any ways, 
feel uh, positive about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Look at the positive side and uh, look to the future, don't look back. Thanks. Any uh, other comments or sharing? I think Rua raised her hand. Yeah, Ru Rua. Hello. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Sorry for joining late. My baby is a little bit sick. So, um, first of all, congratulations, Omnia and Malham, for the interviews. Um, I totally agree, Omnia, with uh, what Dr. Nadir, Marwa, and Mulham said. Just try to look it at the positive way. Like, uh, he is the one who went unprofessional. Uh, and uh, I think he just wanted to make it like a friendly interview. That's why he keep talking in Arabic, like this is familiar. And one thing that uh, you are from Hamad, and I think this is a very reputable residency institutions. That's why maybe he didn't ask a lot about your CV and your resume because they already know it and they know that you are from Hamad. Just uh, don't be intimidated by that. And hopefully we'll get more in January and February as well. Um, well, I have an interview last week. It was from a university program. Um, first day was the informal day. Uh, it's like a happy hour with the residents. One of them was Sudanese, but uh, I think he didn't care about us. We were two Sudanese uh, females invited, but uh, like he, he didn't give us like a sense of Oh yeah, you are from Sudan. I'm interesting. He just keep talking about the program and uh, answered the questions in a very generic way. But this, uh, there was no program coordinator included in the happy hour. And even in the second day, it was a direct one-to-one -one interview. Um, I was interviewed by two, uh, not, one, not one of them in the program director. The two are the faculties. One uh, is the associate program director. Um, so, uh, the first interview, um, she, asked, she she started by introducing herself and telling me like uh, um, tips or like points professionally and points about her personal life. And then she asked me to introduce myself. And, uh, and then uh, she asked why this program and why specifically this area. So thankfully minutes before the program, I tried to search the area and it has it, it's an area that uh, not very big but um, characterized by, with amazing outdoor parks and outdoor places. So I, I try to mention in um, when I introduced myself that I'm a person who loves spending time outdoors. So when she asked me why this area, I have an answer ready. Like uh, I love the place and uh, I have visited uh, the state in general. And uh, I, I think it's a good place to settle and it have a lot of amazing outdoor parks. So this was the first question. Then she asked me about uh, what are my strengths? And I mentioned the, the pregnancy story. I think all of you know it. And although I was avoiding mentioning my baby, but she asked, uh, um, hope the pregnancy went well. And I said, yes. And then she told me that she has two kids. One is two years old and the other is five. And the program is very supportive. Um, a lot of presidents. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Ra, we can hear you. Go ahead. Should I continue? Okay. And then she mentioned that she has uh, two kids and uh, uh, she was pregnant with one of them uh, in the third year of presidency. And all that she needed to do at that time, just she exchanged like uh, the shift with one of her colleagues. And she, I think the elective was the ICU, something like that. So she just wanted to assure me that the program is very supportive. They have never heard issues about residents who have kids and uh, had issues with their colleagues or people who like uh, wasn't able to do their job because of uh, family issues or babies or this kind of stuff. So she was reassuring me with the supportive environment and the supportive community. And then uh, 
she just stopped and she asked me also about uh, the research experience, specifically Michigan State University and one research at Duke University I did two years ago in the US. It was also like an online research. So uh, after that, this also take like 12 minutes. She started uh, telling me, if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. So I thought uh, she was trying to, I wish she could ask more about my CV. So when I ask her questions, I try to ask a question that I can relate and try to bring something in my CV. So I started to ask her about the teaching opportunities in the program and making her know that uh, I have been teaching assistant in the university for a couple of years. And I have an experience in that. She was very interesting and then asked me, uh, do you have another question? I asked her like four or five questions, each one apart. Like I asked the question and then she answered. I tried to link it to something in my TV and then she told me, do you have another questions? So um, I tried to make the conversation go on. And uh, then I asked also her about the volunteer workshop, if, uh, what, did, what did they do usually for the community? And uh, I also tried to link this to my volunteership work during the university and after graduation. Um, what else? I think that was uh, the whole thing. It, was, it took about 25 minutes. And then there was half an hour break. And then the second interview with the associate program director. Um, she was a very nice person. She, she started by saying, hey, I have read your CV. And I don't want to make this professional or like to go up and ask about things that uh, you did professionally. I, I, I want to know you as a person. So I just took some points and I, I want to chat with you about them. So she didn't even ask about uh, introduce yourself or this generic question. She's, uh, and here I, I remember what you have mentioned, Mulham. Um, I, I, was, I wrote in my hobbies, traveling and Zumba dancing. So she started saying that, oh, I, think, I, I see that you are interested in, in, in traveling and you are a person who loves to travel. I said, yes. Uh, tell me uh, the, the countries that you visit. I mentioned to her, uh, I, I, got, I, I went to the, the countries that I, I, I went to. And then she asked, what was your favorite one and why? And then, uh, interestingly, she went to, to this country as well. And we have shared some experience and things that she did when she visited this country. And then she, uh, surprisingly, uh, I wrote also Zumba dancing. She has been doing Zumba for two years. So she asked a lot about this, like uh, how often do you do this? And when I start, I, I didn't have a rhythm. And what songs do you hear when you, when you do this? And so I think as Mulham said, when you, you wrote something in the hobbies, you have to know it in and out. And then she asked me about what, what do you think are the differences between the United States and Sudan in terms of uh, clinical experience? And uh, I tried to use the advices I get from you all, uh, Dr. Nadir and the fellows. Uh, I didn't talk about Sudan in a negative way, but try to tell her that we use, we, we, we rely on the clinical and uh, the history taking and examination skills in order to make a diagnosis. The third part of diagnostic tools is really minimum in Sudan. And even when you make a diagnosis, you will be challenged by therapeutic options. I told her that, uh, for example, if I suspected spironomegaly, instead of sending a patient to the ultrasound, I will have to do physical exam and measure it by rules. She said, wow, you know what? I think this is something very interesting in Sudan. I, she mentioned to me some stories uh, she was doing, I think, a round with an intern. She just, he just wanted to order an echo because the patient has a cardiac disease. So she mentioned that she was really upset uh, because this is something really cost the patient money. And she think uh, what we are doing in Sudan is good because it, 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 it trained us to use our clinical skills more than depending I think she's disconnected. Yeah, uh, it seems like. Mm -hmm. So 
So I agree with uh, her last point where she mentioned the comparison between the uh, other countries where we focus on the clinical exam and history taking, uh, basically, and then leave the test and uh, imaging uh, for confirmation purpose is not to diagnose things. Uh, and I think it's a good opportunity to, when you're practicing there, is to get the skills. And when you come here to the US, you can use these skills. Uh, it will be beneficial not only for you, the patient, but for the whole system. Uh, definitely, it's a good uh, comparison. So, Hello. Hello, she's back. Go ahead, Uh I think uh, that was it uh, for the second interviewer. And uh, it was very friendly. And uh, I then I, I sent uh, both of them uh, thank you email and try to mention for the first one that I really enjoyed the, how you talk about the supportive environment in the program and how the residents are very friendly to each other and supportive. And in the second one, I mentioned uh, this part of the clinical differences in Sudan and, and, and it's a learning process and each one input is, will be appreciated. And um, she replied to that email, although a lot of uh, the interviewers don't, but she said to me uh, in the email that I really enjoyed the conversation we had. And I think you will be a good fit to our program and you will do very well here. So, that was my experience. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Roa, for sharing. This is really great. Uh, Marwa, you want to add? Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I just, I think this is from the last time I, I talked. Uh, um, mm. I, I don't have anything to add more. Thank you. That's fine. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Uh, I wish you all the best uh, guys who share their experiences and uh, tips and uh, good luck to all of you. For those who didn't get any, yes, please go ahead. Uh, this is for all the fellows and for you, Dr. Nader. To be honest, last year when I did the interviews and after I sent a thank you email, I got some feedbacks after some replied to the emails and say nice things and still I didn't match. So I just wanna know like if someone replied to your email in a good way or you have like you felt comfortable during the interview and everything was good and then they replied with nice emails is that like a hint that they will rank you high or we shouldn't depend on that anyone to any one of you wants to answer this question uh yes Ra. um just congratulations on your interview. Looks like went very well. And you. I think you, uh, for your question, I think you just do your best um, for your knowledge. And just don't worry about what's going to happen. Don't think about last year. Don't think about uh, anything that you have done. And yes, you still do the same. Just uh, rank them and at the way that you feel that they should be ranked. And if, if you mm -hmm. still like the program number one, just put them number one. Just don't rely on the on the thank you. Don't rely on their response. Rely on on your uh, data, if I can if I can say that uh, that mm -hmm. you collected during the interview. Do you like this program? Yes, put them number one. And I think the, the, the last interview went very well, Droa. So mm -hmm. just hope that uh, you get the best of luck and yes. do a lot of praying. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. 
Why I think you this want is to... hard when yeah, you right. have limited number of interviews. You, you want to make sure that you don't miss any chance. But at the end of the day, it's everyone has to do his job, as you mentioned. Thank you. Thanks, Marwa, and uh, thanks, uh, Asa. Um, while and yeah. then Sumi, you wanna add something? Uh, you raise your hand. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I would like to first thank uh, Sumi for the presentation. It was very, very uh, interesting topic. Um, and thank you all for sharing your experiences about the interviews, Mulham, Marwa, and Omnia and Roa. Uh, I don't know about, uh, I wanna just add something about Omnia. She mentioned uh, he speaks in Arabic and he, like, I don't know, and we wasn't there. We didn't know what exactly he said in Arabic. Was it unprofessional, inappropriate? So we cannot just judge upon that. So I don't, I, I don't see anything uh, unusual that's usually happened during every interview um, about Ru'a and the thanks you letter. I have the same experience from the last year. I got a very, very good reply after the thank you letter and still I didn't match. So you should not rely on that at all. Just like, as I said, rank the program that you feel that you want to be in. And uh, best of luck for everybody with the match who got interview. And I hope like for everyone who did not get invited to get invited soon, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Ailan Azza. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add a uh, couple of points. One is when you have the interview, you think about the group that they are selected to do interviews. So you can, you can be interviewed by one person or two person or couple, uh, but in the program, there may, might be more than uh, the group that they interviewed you. Uh, with that said, they have the list, as we said in the previous uh, uh, meetings. So they have their own checklist and mark like they give you four uh, score out of five or five out of five in each uh, point. And that's the person who interviewed you. Uh, but they have the whole committee and then they will uh, put their list. So despite the fact that you might get a thank you letter or uh, encouraging letter or uh, possibly accepting letter for you, uh, it's not an official one. They cannot say we uh, gonna rank you high, it's illegal for them. And they cannot accept you like to the program, it's illegal. So uh, if you get one, it's a positive thing. You, you think about it, it's uh, that the program uh, raise about your status high, but still when it comes to the matching, the ranking system, they have to put their list and you have to put your list and then the computer will match you. So by saying that, it doesn't uh, mean that they did not rank you high, but maybe you have other uh, candidate in the same list and then the computer will try to match according to the other people who put that program higher in their list. So there are more than one factor. Just think about what you can do. Don't think about what happens on the other end uh, because you cannot control that. And some of them might not control that. So if you interviewed by uh, the program director, he is not the final say, he is not the one who will say, yes, I want this. They have to go through the committee and then they put their place together. Uh, so as I as, uh, mentioned, think about what program fits you, put this on, a, uh, on your list and organize them or sort them to your best knowledge if you accept the first one and then put it on your top list. Uh, and then they will do the same and hopefully you can match on that basis. 
So don't worry about uh, they gave you a good letter. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have highly positive for you. You depend on that. Uh, I wouldn't uh, recommend that you depend 100% on that. There are many factors uh, play in the ranking system. So go by what your heart tells you to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadir. I totally agree. I think we should do our part and then pray. Mulham, you want to add? I would like to say thank you, Dr. Nadir, for the points you mentioned. And congrats, Roa, for uh, the interview. I can't add anything uh, after what Dr. Nadir mentioned. It's the whole point there. But I want to share that there's an app called Prism, NRMP, the Prism. This is an app which helps you to uh, place all your programs and allow you to rank based on 10 points system, which is based on location, based on how you feel, uh, the program director, the faculty, the, the teaching, the academics. It's present in Apple and even Samsung or the Galaxy uh, uh, yeah, app store. So it's very good. I did for every program that process and it actually shows you exactly what you really like based on the program. Your future fellowship advancement, research, involvement and everything. And based on it, you would be able to tell uh, based on 10 point system, clearly what is your, uh, what you really like. And I think that's good. Please uh, try to download it. It's Prism, it's present. And I'll share also the, the name of it in the app uh, in WhatsApp. And yes, be, please. Yeah, and shall will be helpful for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mulham. Thank you. That's a great thing. I like technology, so I like the way of uh, using apps and I agree with you. Khalid, go ahead. Uh, wants to add something? Uh, yes, I want to add on what Az Az uh, said earlier uh, that you. Dr. Nader also mentioned this. Uh, I haven't applied to the match yet and I haven't been in an interview yet, but I read that you should always rank the programs based on your preferences, uh, not to take into account what you think the program director uh, uh, think of you and uh, how the program ranked you should not be taken into account when you are ranking the program. I think uh, it's because the algorithm works in a way that uh, uh, it matches you if uh, uh, if you if you put the program in your list and they put you in your list uh, in a way that uh, it it wouldn't matter. So um, the the only thing that should be taken into account is uh, uh, your preferences regarding the the program. I, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Khalid. Thank you, Khalid. Any additional uh, comments or questions? Marwa? Uh, yes. Um, first, congratulations to Roa. Um, I think it went well and all the best to everyone. Uh, just, uh, I have a question regarding, um, uh, I don't know if someone can help me with this, community programs and community uh, and university affiliated programs. Some are like, uh, I have been interviewed in, in some programs that are listed as community programs, uh, but at the same time, they mentioned that they have, for example, the students from such university um, rotating there or having like a, doing their clerkship there. So uh, w to what extent does that make difference and in terms of like, um, how the strong the program is and in terms of uh, like uh, maybe fellowship opportunities and um, I, I don't know if someone like can highlight on this maybe like have anyone came across such such, such thing before and like like the, is there any clear demarcation that if like this is a community program and they have students rotating there what is the difference from uh, a program listed as a university affiliated one. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Marwa. That's a very good question. 
Um, I have some experience. I, I'm not sure probably Dr. Nadir can clarify it more. But um, as I understand your question, probably there are some programs that are like, you know, like university program, which is like university has their own program. But I guess every community program has to be affiliated by a university. Uh, you know, like any any community program, they, like let's say Michigan uh, State University, they have like, you know, they have their own program. Uh, like which is like Michigan State program and under the Michigan University there are 20 program which is like community program which is affiliated by MSEO. But my guess is always university program is um, you know like good they have lot, tremendous opportunity for research and then fellowship programs and like you know advanced fa academic faculties and all that. Um, so of course, uh, university program probably better, but we should not be biased by community programs like, you know, that community programs are like, you know, like bad, I mean, worse than university. I feel some communities program has even better than university program. So you have to go by program by program and like, you know, and uh, like, and then rank like that way. Other thing is like some community program, you know, there is a very small community program. They don't have research opportunities or like, uh, you know, extra fund to provide, um, I think resident to attend meetings or like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about internationally or like nationally, probably local meetings, they have fund for like, you can attend locally or something like that. But still, they are. I, I, I don't. I'll not consider that. That's a bad program either, because you have to go through the patient demographics, you know. And another thing is like patient care perspective. I think the university care university program is a tertiary care hospital, whereas like community program may, may not be a tertiary care hospital. It just provides, you know, some extent. Uh, community program does not sometimes, you know, allow you to like, you know, they have some limitations. Whereas of course, university program has like lots of, you know, opportunity to learn in regards to research and as well as clinical. Of course, they have tremendous uh, amounts of fellowship program. And if you graduated from a university program, it has a, sometimes a big name, but at the same time, some community programs are affiliated with a good university that also has a big name. It does not mean that, you know, like you will be, um, like, you know, you will be like, if you graduated from the community program, your chances are less uh, for getting a fellowship. I don't think so as a candidate, as a resident, if you, uh, you know, do a good job as a resident and you have a good letters from your program director after and good faculties. And if you publish, you present and, uh, you know, clinically you do good, you are a good candidate. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, like, uh, of course the people who have research experience uh, and like publications as it is a good fit for academic environment. So those at a university, I think they prefers uh, those candidate, but uh, at the same time, your you know, year of graduation, there are so many other barriers too. At the same time, community programs, I think they, they take care, like it's not a overall application. Sometimes they only, uh, you know, like emphasize on like your year of graduation and your score. Uh, because as they cannot, they don't need basically to, you know, like a person to do research because uh, they don't have that facility. In a state, they're treating only patients. So, you know, they, all they really depends on, like rely on like how much score do you have, like, you know, and how recent graduate are you? So it, it's, it's like depends, but I mean, that's, that's probably I felt. I want to add something for uh, Omnia's comment. Um, Last year, I went to interview for interview. Um, uh, you know, there was a faculty who has the same language I speak, uh, you know, like, uh, um, but uh, when, uh, I mean, as it was like one to one interview, so I interviewed the program director, and that's the person has like, you know, I interviewed a faculty, that's the person who was my last uh, one to one interview. So at the end, after our conversation, he definitely asked me where I'm from and uh, I mean, my CV and all that. And um, he asked me that, uh, uh, do you know that, uh, you know, I'm from the same part of Bangladesh? So I said, yes, um, I went to the website and uh, I, when I was looking for your research, uh, you know, topics and all that, I found out that you are from there, but I did not 
uh, you know, proactively open my mouth. When he said that, I said yes. And um, I said, yeah, it's good to know that you are from my, uh, you know, home city. But at the end, like he speaks like, you know, two words for my mother language, but I did not react uh, like that. Although I, I did not like it, but I did not react like that, that I did not like it because I'm a residency, you know, like interviewee. So I thought, you know, I have to adopt everything, whatever they provide. So whatever uh, they do. So I did not react like, so my uh, advice to everyone is, um, you know, like, I don't think, I mean, of course, this is not super professional, but at the same time, you know, uh, as we are in a, as we left our home country, everybody, when we see our home country's people, we may be, sometimes we become emotional and we become like, uh, you know, we want to communicate with the same language. So it's it's a personal. Uh, I I I can say it's someone's personality also. And at the same time, you know, some people um, they are not hundred percent time. They don't show themselves that they are very professional. You know, sometimes you have to break some professionalism as well. So uh, I mean, don't take it too seriously. And like you know, it can happen. And if it happens in future, just take it very like easily and. Uh, move forward you know like uh, it's it's nothing to do with your uh, credential or his credential or anything this is very natural and I feel that's the way like you know as we are away from our country when we see our uh, you know home countries people will become very excited and emotional and we want to speak our own language so you know that's uh, that's probably that's the way I take it and uh, you know I'll move forward for that and um, uh, something I, uh, that's for Omnia, I think. And uh, I think Rua for your things, as you said, um, the most important thing is like, you know, like uh, when you go for an interview, I feel they can say, someone can tell you like, oh, I'll rank you higher. Someone can tell you did very good job. That's a natural expression. I mean, and this is a very standard behavior for all the programs I felt. And it is nothing to do with the ranking or matching or anything. Uh, let's say like they, they will tell you like, I'll rank you higher, but they have six position. And, you know, they rank probably 15, um, the highest rank, they rank probably 15 people, but as they have like six position left, so first six people will be matched, other seven people will may not match, or like first 10 people is going to be matched, five people left unmatched. So, you know, it, it, it is not like they're, they're also doing their job, like they're basically ranking you higher, but, you know, because of the ranking system, you may end up with not matching. I also got a very good response uh, last year and like uh, from the letter and from there, you know, I was very happy also. Like, I feel like, you know, I already matched. I mean, honestly. So, you know, I mean, I learned from my uh, last year mistakes and, you know, like, I mean, not a mistakes. I mean, I feel like now I take easily if someone say you did good and your CV is good, I just express, okay, that's a compliment, not beyond that. I mean, at the end of the day, you do your job. And then, you know, if you feel that uh, program you need, you want to do high, rank higher, do it. Not based on their response, not based on their behavior, because they do all standard behavior with every candidate. That's what I felt. And it is nothing to do with the match because, uh, you know, I was so disheartened and I was not able to accept it when I did not match. Like, you know, I thought like, what's next, you know, uh, after this behavior and this response, still I did not match. So, uh, you know, where to improve and what to do. But now I take it easily. There is nothing to do with that, actually. It is a standard behavior, normal behavior. You may match, you may not match. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Somi. Thank you very much. I have been through this also last year, so it was really devastating. But I think we all learn from our previous experiences. As you mentioned, not mistakes, but the match is a totally different, different, different story. We do our part and then they do our part. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Somi. Oh, sure. uh, that's, that's it. I just want, wanted to thank you. And like, uh, I really agree with you with all of the comments that you mentioned. Thank you, Marwa, as well. Marham, you want to add? OK. I would like to say thank you, Somi, for mentioning uh, the points here. I do agree with the points you mentioned about um, for what Marwa mentioned about the affiliated universities and community and university uh, programs. But I wanna share that some, you know, there is some 
programs which are community uh, might be not affiliated like New York programs. Some of them are not affiliated. There are small programs which have less risk or ability to uh, advance in the future. And this is why most uh, international graduates don't prefer to go to New York. They consider them less chance to go to the future or advancement. But then again, our goal is first to match and then see how it goes. But uh, based on what Marvel said, yeah, some com community programs are a bit, if you have the opportunity to go for, for example, universities, there, for example, Michigan State University, it's based on the name itself. Uh, some are considered to be um, an Ivy League programs. Some are considered to be high tire programs and some are middle and some are low. So based on what are those, if they are Ivy League, they're affiliated with a community program, then they are a really big program. That's a really big community program. For instance, if you're involved with a low tire uh, pro, uh, university and involved with a community program, then you would notice that the future advancement of the residents is a bit most likely in low tire uh, competitive. This depends upon your dream. Are you looking for a less competitive uh, specialty? This doesn't mean it's bad in, in terms of fellowship. For instance, in tire medicine, uh, the less competitive ones are uh, usually in, uh, nephrology, um, and there is also internal, uh, sorry, ID, infectious disease, and geriatric. Those are the three usually in the list. It depends on your dream. Are you looking towards those or endocrinology, which is in the middle? And then the higher a bit, there is uh, rheumatology, and there is also um, he hemonco, palm crit, and cardio and gastro, which is the higher top. That's really the toughest. If you're looking for that, sometimes require more time, more effort if you're involved with community programs and so on. So it depends on your dreams and goals. If you're looking towards a hospitalist, a future or a primary care, then it doesn't really matter. It depends on where you fit uh, in the program and based on the city also. So, and yeah, so I just recall based on what Sumi said, I recalled an app uh, or a program known as Doximetry. So this is a good, uh, where you can look into programs in detail and identify the future advancement of the residents. Uh, you know, the president, for example, two years ago was in a program, search their name in Doximetry, you'll find them there. Doximetry is similar to LinkedIn, but for doctors. So you can mention the name of doctor, you'd find immediately there were a resident a couple of day, uh, years ago, but right now they're in a university. So you would know exactly where their career is right now. And that helps you in terms of your uh, knowing if they are in a, the same special, uh, subspecialty of your interest or not. So most of us really, when you're thinking about uh, the ranking, are focusing on the fellowship. Because uh, if you're having a high thing in your mind, then most probably you choose something else based on that uh, and so on, yeah. So once again, as soon we said, mentioned the name of the university or its league involvement, Ivy League, higher up, middle or lower makes a main difference. And this is one of the questions we can ask during the interview, which is where, do, where does your fellow uh, or residents advance? So this helps a lot. And if you didn't ask that, you can ask them uh, in a message right now in the next couple of days, which shows a true interest in their program. So yeah, I think, yeah, I did ask those questions during the interviews, but if you didn't ask more, you can ask to show interest, especially for the residents, you can ask them directly. And yeah, I really hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the points and bringing up like maybe I can ask some of them I did, some of them I didn't. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mulham. And uh, as Mulham said, you can uh, sometimes look at the website. You can get uh, some of the information, like at my uh, in my program uh, here in internal medicine. You can look at previous uh, residents and what they did after that, they listed on the website, uh, what fellowship and uh, also you can use other program as Malham uh, mentioned. Uh, one other point I just want to raise as uh, you all know, uh, the steps you want is you want to get into a program at this level. The future, you can think about it as a second step. So you don't follow all your dreams to the second step until you go to the first step. Planning is good, but at this time, I think we need to get into put your foot in the door before you think about the next step. Uh, so wherever you want to go, uh, think about the position first the residency. 
if you are interested in a certain uh, fellowship, let's say, you can do that even if you ended up in a, a remote uh, community program that uh, don't offer fellowship or don't uh, make it easier for their residents. By saying that uh, I did my first year in New Jersey, it's a very small community program. It was affiliated with uh, university, but uh, the number of residents there, they were not um, involved in research as much. Uh, and uh, at that time, when I looked at the website nowadays, uh, most of the residents are very competitive in research and uh, the previous one uh, went into fellowship and so. Uh, one thing you can do if you end up in a small program or community program is when you do your elective in the second year or maybe in the first year, try to select a, an elective in a bigger program or a well-known program for the specialty that you want to go to. Uh, let's say you want to do nephrology. You did enter the program uh, the first year. Try to do your nephrology rotation in a big uh, university uh, well known for that uh, special speciality. You can spend uh, some time there and you can repeat that if I'm not mistaken. But at least you will have some letters of recommendation from that program. Uh, that will help you when you apply for fellowship in the future. Uh, I know that because one of my colleagues here uh, in MSU when I came, uh, they did some rotation. Uh, I don't remember how, it, was it one month or two months in a bigger university? And he went into the, the, the fellowship that he wanted. So there are ways to improve your situation or uh, at the level of planning for the fellowship uh, while you are doing your residency. So these are tricks that you can do while you are, if you ended up in a small program, you can do. Uh, if you end up in a bigger program community or I mean uh, uh, academic uh, program, then it might be easier for you to get the experience, the research, the letters right away. But it shouldn't be uh, a hindrance for you to run these programs. Thank you. Khalid? Thank you. Malham, you want to add? No, I want to say thank you. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, everyone. Any uh, other points or any other comments? Thank you, Mola. Uh, so um, you can jump into any uh, question or comments and while we are talking. We will switch to the research part. Uh, guys, do you want to take a break or should we jump into the research? It's about one o'clock here. In some time. So the research part, um, we submitted the information on the data for the statisticians, the students from the statistic center, and he is working. So uh, we're gonna meet with him tomorrow and see he has some couple of questions, but I don't think it will take long for him to give us the, the, the result back for the abstract. And I think we can submit it on time. So the next step is to work specifically for that uh, abstract is uh, how you can develop a team where you can present and play the role. Each one will have some section and then uh, try to make the abstract like a PowerPoint uh, slide uh, presentable. So we can talk about that in the future uh, for that team. The other abstracts, uh, I didn't hear from you guys. Anyone hear anything? Uh, 
and positive four. Uh, yes, uh, regarding the false abstract, I didn't receive an email yet. And uh, when I log into the website, it says it's still locked for review. Okay, so that's a good news. Uh, no news is good. So uh, we're gonna give them some time, hopefully uh, by next week, a week after we will have some uh, uh, news. If we don't, at least now uh, we can work on uh, parallel thing. So uh, we can assume that they did not accept by next week or the week after. So we don't have to wait until we hear uh, negative results from them. So from now, uh, I think Mulham was started on changing some of the title and the other team, they can also try to work on changing the title, maybe work on adjusting the abstract. And then uh, we can work on the data that we have with the statistician as well. And if we can add all this in a different uh, layout, uh, uh, a new abstract, we can say, uh, that we can submit to AGS. So in the meantime, we can look at previous AGS uh, abstract, and see what the format look like, what they accept, what their topic, what their uh, highlighted area they want us to contribute to, uh, so that we can match our uh, abstract when we submit it to their need. Uh, we can work on that uh, in the next coming days. Do you have questions about that? Uh, Dr. Nadir, I have a question for that. Uh, first, I would like to know, that, uh, you know, as uh, I think Lubaba's paper, I feel like uh, the depression one, probably, you know, as it is accepted already. So, I think at this point, we need to know like how many, who will be working for what project. Uh, so it will be easier for us to, you know, like, uh, like, you know, work on that based on that. So when uh, we have a fellow meetings uh, last, not this week, last week, uh, and then, uh, you know, we are discussing about like, we are trying to understand like who is interested for what projects. And based on that, the cardiovascular, the project I was involved, the cardiovascular and COVID. So at this, at that meeting, uh, Omnia, Marwa, uh, um, Aja, and I think Khalid, this, uh, they, they are very interested to that project. So I feel like these five people, I have like five people for that project. I'm not sure that Mulham is working another one, the commonest uh, risk factor for COVID. And, you know, if we, I think at this point, if we know that, you know, all of we, how we'll be split it. So we, based on that, uh, let's say my project, I have like five persons. So we, we all five can meet and then uh, we can, you know, split the work. Like somebody will write introduction, somebody will write the results. Uh, it will be easier and it will be clear for all of us instead of like, you know, like wait or something. So if that would be clarified, you know, I, I would appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, you raised a really important point. And uh, okay, so uh, this is called project management part. So task uh, assignment and uh, who is responsible for what, which is uh, great. Uh, but before we jump into that, I think we should focus on the theme of that abstract. Uh, as you said, it depends on the individual. Every one of you has their own interest, or maybe they want to fix on one or maybe more. It depends on how much time you have in your hand or how active you want to be involved. So it's hard for me to assign people to say, here, you go to that abstract or do this, do that. So I think the now we have the four teams, each uh, team leader, you can uh, ask your team members, the three or four and in your team, uh, see who is interested. You mentioned uh, five in your uh, abstract uh, for your project, let's say it's a project. Then uh, those five might be uh, interested only in one abstract, which is fine. Uh, if someone of them is interested in a different uh, abstract as well, or if they don't want this abstract, 
they can jump into a different one. But if they want to do two or more, that's also possible. Um, so I want to focus on those who are not assigned. Uh, I think the team leader uh, will check each one if they have a project that they are assigned themselves to, or they can uh, speak to the uh, abstract, the first author of that abstract. Uh, let's say it's a project and that's project uh, leader. So I want everyone to assign themselves to at least one project uh, from the five projects that we have. So we have two uh, with the COVID and the data from Sparrow. We have two COVID with data from uh, uh, nursing home. And we have one uh, about the case uh, presentation. So who are the team leaders now for this month? Four of you, Sumi, Malham. Uh, no, okay. You, uh, the other teams, I think Lubaba. No, Khalid, I think. Khalid. Ali. Ali. Yeah. And someone else on the last team. So these are the team leaders. Each one of you, I want you to get me a list of your team, each one of the team member in your team, I want you to ask them which um, project they want to get involved in. So we have a list of the project and the member in that or uh, the uh, fellows in that project. I hope we can finish this by today. I don't think it will take long for you uh, as a team uh, leader for this. Uh, time. Uh, if you have problem, let me know. Uh, I will get into contact with you guys. But I appreciate if we have the project and who are in this project, each one of these five projects. Uh, and I don't want anyone to be left out. Uh, there could be a possibility of <clears throat> someone working on different uh, project. That's well and good. Um, so this is the first step. The second step is each project, they have the team now, then the project leader will uh, meet with the team and then they can assign tasks as far as what to do, what's required next. So let's say you said that uh, uh, we already collected some data. So how about the presentation? Who's gonna work on the poster? Who's gonna work on the... Uh, introduction if this is accepted or who's gonna do whatever task according to the project. So I think this will be the next step after we assign the team to each project. Does that make sense so far? I see Murham and Marwa raise their hands. I did raise my hand, but a bit earlier. Um, but I, I wanna say something here. Um, I want to promote the project so that everyone knows the project. And if they're interested, please let me know. Right now, uh, Ali is with me. And last week, we have had a meet, uh, meet of the week. And we changed the topic because Dr. Nadi said it's, uh, it's important to change the topic right now because that's probably the reason why they're not interested in the area itself. So uh, the topic was identifying the commonest risk factor of COVID-19 hospitalization in the geriatric population. So it was too long. and. The, uh, Ali said, well, why not change hospitalization to morbidity and mortality? That's more interesting. Then we shortened it a bit. By the end, we came to the conclusion it's the best is the risk factors for COVID-19 mortality and morbidity in the geriatric population. So shorter, straight to the point. And this is the new topic. And please, if anyone feels uh, they want to change it more, please let me know. And also to another. If it's interesting, let me know. Sure, um, sure. Uh, it's it's uh, nice to think about yeah changing, uh, but the best way is to use two 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 tools. One tool is you think about what you are applying to. Let's say next step is we are going to apply to AGS. So the step is to look at what they want 
in their goal for this meeting, coming meeting, or the themes, as I say. If they focus on certain things, the title is supposed to match these goals or themes that they have. Um, and then the next part is to make it interesting that it's catching the eye and it's meaningful. And as you said, it's short. Um, there's ways to, to change the title to make it uh, short or uh, catching. Uh, but the thing that you can do also is you look at previous abstract uh, titles. Uh, I, in the beginning of this follow, I sent you two files, one for residents and one from medical students. Yeah abstract submitted to, and uh, I don't remember what uh, uh, society, but it has list of the abstract. Look at just the titles and see how they um, manipulate or how they come up with different ways of uh, put the title as catchy. And then you can change yours according to the two criteria that we talked about. And you have examples uh, from the files that I sent you in the beginning. So this is the best way. Uh, there are a couple of videos uh, in the app about how you can uh, come up with a title. I agree with you, it must be a shorter one, uh, but it's supposed to be a meaningful and at the same time catching uh, the eye and at the same time meeting the requirement or the goals for that. Uh, so it's kind of uh, working in layers. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mulham. Thank you, Ali, is, um, for working with Mulham on that. Uh, Marwa, you want to add? Yeah, sure. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, I just have uh, a few questions uh, I would sure. like to ask. So, um, regarding the, the, the data, um, and actually, it's maybe related to Mulham's uh, um, topic. I find it very interesting, and it was one of the interesting topics for me from the start. But uh, like, is there any chance to maybe add more information, ask for more information regarding the patients, or is it like just this is what we have to uh, like deal with? That that's it. Because, uh, for example, I I read about uh, a study um, I believe in China about uh, risk factors for severe disease and mortality. In, uh, in in patients with um, um, who develop pneumonia or something like that, as complication of COVID, and they mentioned two uh, two things. Um, one of them was age, increased age, which is applies to our population in the, in the first place. The other thing was neutrophilia or uh, high white blood cell count. So, like, is there any way to get, for example, lab data, like? just include like for example instead of saying diabetes is there any way to get hemoglobin a and c so we can see for example if the control of diabetes itself is a factor or diabetes per se like i don't know like i think just few things can uh, like fine tune the even the, the results or the thing that we can mention like make it like more specific more uh rather than just open risk factors. I, I don't know if this might help and able to, to get that. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention here because people will like try to, will try to uh, maybe contact and, and, and see each group who will be included in which I just wanted to let you know that my phone unfortunately stopped working so I, I won't be able to communicate with anyone on WhatsApp uh, for the coming few days, unfortunately, I will, will try to fix it or get a new one, but it's gonna be up like a process trying to get the numbers again and everything. So like, just like, so everybody knows um, if I don't respond, this is because I, I cannot. So I, I apologize for that. Um, these are the, the two things uh, that I wanted to mention. I had another question, but I kind of forgot what it, <laughs> what it was. So yeah, That's thank okay. you. That's okay. Uh, let me go back a uh, step. Uh, the, the phone problem, no problem. You can just email and uh, we can communicate as far as your interest of what topic. Uh, as far as you are involved, this is what matters to me. Uh, I don't want to go by and then all of a sudden we'll find someone 
fuel is not listed in any of the projects. Uh, uh, so I hope everyone is active and uh, I hope the team leaders will, will uh, get that done. Uh, back to the first question about adding new data. Um, there are two steps to that. One is to go the whole process again. Uh, we need to go through the IRB, add some of the whatever factor or uh, variable that you want to add, lab, let's say A1C, uh, CBC, or uh, sedimentation layer, or whatever you think about. These are new variables that were not listed for the IRB uh, for uh, Spero and uh, MSU. So it's going to be just adding to the application that we submitted if they can approve that so that we can get uh, more information. Uh, so that might take some time and it may, it's supposed to be uh, just uh, a query that the IT will run and get the information for us. If we need to get uh, more detailed information about each patient, then we can do the same process, but it will take longer and we need to have an access to look at the chart ourselves and review the chart, get the detailed information that we want. So these are the two steps. So one is uh, um, shorter and one is detailed but longer uh, but the same process uh, we need to go through that's one way if you want to go into depth of getting more details about what you want to look at for diabetes or other uh, specific condition which is good 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 thinking the other way to go about is to submit the abstract with whatever data we have now and then in your discussion part you will say we found that some papers or some studies showed that the importance of and then you can add your variables here that i want uh, to think about a1c i want to think about whatever other variables in your discussion part and then in the end, you will say this work need to be uh, continued. So your next step is to investigate more and more. So basically what you're saying, we came with question, we got an answer, but our, uh, as we are getting this answer, we found that we need more information, which will raise another question. And this is the research part is, mm -hmm you come up with an answer, but that raise more questions for you, which is uh, opening the door for another part of the work or a different route for you to go into depth. That part might be the shorter way to do uh, your next step as far as uh, sub, uh, submitting your uh, abstract and getting done for this <coughs> period. Did you get my point? Uh, yes, yes, I, I understand. Um, yeah, thank you for, for clarifying. You're welcome. And the uh, project team, they can discuss as far as what they want to do. And mm -hmm. I'm here to help. So thank you. Bro. You're welcome. Any other uh, comments or uh, any other questions? Go ahead, uh, Mulham and Roa. Okay, and go ahead, Roa first, yeah. I have one question uh, regarding the deadline for the PowerPoint presentation, Dr. Nader. Yes, go ahead. Uh, when is the deadline? I think you mentioned the 31 of uh, December, right? 
Yes. And we have to submit like this version. So I, I really want to know if you can extend this like one week later so we can do our best. Absolutely. That's fine. Let's do yes. it uh, January 7th, uh, the deadline. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. No problem. And uh, I spoke to Ali, and I want the team leaders uh, in each team is to uh, see how their team are working on this. Uh, if they are progressing, that's well and good. If there is any uh, problems or any issues, they can talk together as far as how to solve it. Uh, if there is uh, any way I can help, let me uh, get involved and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Uh, Mulham, go ahead. Mulham. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, topics in the app. It's not assigned. I have tried to check it, and I even some we tried, we discussed, uh, and we found it difficult to find uh, our names in the app for the PowerPoint presentations. Uh... So it's not assigned. I thought oh, when you, uh, I thought, I thought when you open the app, it will show you your uh, first uh, slide. That will be yours. Is that not true? There's like sixteen in front of me. Sixteen uh, PowerPoint presentations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry about that. So, uh, um, go ahead. Uh, sorry, if I can say something, I think they are assigned. If you go to tasks, you will find the topic that is assigned for you. And instead of opening all the topics, if you go to the task in the app, in the app yeah, uh, I think, yeah, you drag down and you will see the topic that's assigned for you. Oh, my. oh, yeah, yeah. You found it? Sorry. Okay, yeah. That was quite as easy, yeah, yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you, Lvala. You're welcome. I think it's assigned. And yes. thank you, Dr. Nader. Uh, you're welcome. Dr. Nader. Yeah, so, so when, as she said, just for the demo, if someone uh, not following, uh, you go to the task, and uh, it's um, you can add the link here when you are done. But basically, this is an instruction under the instruction you will have your uh, assigned uh, slide. And then below that, if you want, I'm not sure, no. The, so this is your assignment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions uh, or any other comments? Uh, Lubaba or Marwa, you raise your hand. Uh, just one question about that um, regarding like it's going to be like uh, I'm going to be presenting the specific topic and like my voice is going to show in the background like is it this is this way or like like uh, I don't know filming a, like a, a, a video in real time or something doing this uh, I don't know how that works just to clarify like a, like it's it's the same as like uh, when you go to the PowerPoint there is a part where you can um, I would say where um, I don't know. In the slideshow, there is a part record the slideshow, so you can rec record your voice while you move on, on with, with the slideshow. Is this is what is request required or? Basically, if you can do it uh, the best way you can, if it's only the voice and then the slides, uh, that will be a way to do it. Uh, the other way is to create uh, like the same what we are doing now, a Zoom meeting. Uh, and then you present in a Zoom meeting. There will be no other participant. So you will just present to yourself. I basically. see. You All can right. do that. And uh, there is a way when you go to the uh, three dots on the right side, there is a way to stream uh, like live stream to YouTube. 
Okay. Uh, and then you can save that as a video and uh -huh. you can share the link to that video when you are done. All right, thank you very much. For You're clarifying. welcome, sure. And if you want to be fancy, there is a way to be fancy. There is a loom, uh, it's uh, an extension to the Chrome. If you are using Chrome, uh, there is a way to use some extension where you will have your image and then the slides or whatever window you want to present, you can uh, present that way as well. So there are different ways of doing it. <clears throat> the simplest way, whatever you can uh, get yourself familiarized with is, is what, I don't wanna put pressure on you guys. I want you to just, it's a, a way to learn about the topic for yourself. And in the meantime, you improve your skills as far as uh, presenting stuff and putting stuff in a good way and uh, using the tools that you have. Thank you. Any other questions or? So uh, I'm gonna ask the team later to give me a list of the team member and which member assigned to uh, what project. And then the project uh, leader will have their own uh, list. Uh, we can talk together about that. So uh, from now on, then it will be a project that has a leader uh, for that project and then a team uh, for that project. Then this team, they can assign themselves or they can uh, meet uh, on WhatsApp or email, or they can uh, get a Zoom meeting, discuss about uh, what the task they want to do. And each one will assign themselves about, I will do this, you will do that. And hopefully we can get this uh, project done, if that makes sense to you guys. If you have questions as far as the project leader or the team leader, let me know and I will uh, go over the steps with you. Other questions, any uh, comments, anything uh, about the projects uh, that we need to discuss further? So uh, as far as planning um, for the next few months, uh, I think we should focus on two things as far as <clears throat> uh, the fellowship. Uh, one is uh, to learn some things in the research part. Uh, in the app, we have some uh, in the curriculum. I'm gonna share my screen. Share screen. So, uh, we want to go over some of these uh, objectives. Uh, some of you might have some idea uh, about the ethics, let's say, or the topics. We discussed some of these <coughs> steps and uh, there are topics that we need to discuss or elaborate on. Uh, for these topics, I think uh, we can work on getting them done uh, as groups, as like divided, like we talked about uh, COVID in four teams, we can assign some teams to present something uh, or we can do it ourselves, everyone. Uh, you can do self-learning, you can uh, attack one topic, uh, learn about it for yourself. And uh, if someone wants to volunteer and explain things, uh, to the group that's another way. The third way is we can assign uh, 30 days and then we can make different uh, Zoom meeting for each of these. Uh, and then whoever can join, they can join uh, that way. And then uh, 
we can cover all the items uh, by the end of the fellowship, hopefully. Any questions about this or any suggestions? <laughs> Marwa, you raising your hand. I'm not sure if this is from before. Sorry, this. <laughs> I believe yeah. I, I, if if I don't do it, it, it stays. That's all right. Uh, so That's all right. That's okay. So the the tools that we need to focus as far as the next step or what we want to do uh, is how we can manage the data or analyze the data. So in your part, what you want to do is uh, maybe refresh about the statistics, refresh about how we can uh, manipulate the data to present it in a meaningful way. Uh, so there are a couple of videos about statistics. If you want to go into the app or YouTube, you can look at uh, the basic stuff. Uh, Hopefully we can ask the students from the stat center to help us also. Maybe they can teach us something. Uh, if you have specific area, we can ask them to focus on these areas. And hopefully when we work on this uh, project that we have some data, then it makes sense uh, when we present it in uh, the final abstract. It's just, uh, a tool that you need to know if you want to do some research uh, in the future. That's one part. And the other part is how can we get into the final uh, product, uh, product uh, such as uh, a paper, how we can complete the project to the final uh, results that's publishable. So uh, the last part we are going to discuss or work on is how we can work into writing a paper using references, using uh, mm -hmm. references tools like EndNote or other uh, online tools. And then we can discuss about submitting and then reviewing and then resubmitting. Um, those process. Does it make sense to you guys as far as planning? Yes, I, I think it's a good idea and that I think we need yeah, to have maybe the experience of everything like trying to you know, filling the, the, the knowledge gap that we have regarding the statistics and even the submission and everything. So like it would be like in the future, hopefully everyone can be able to complete the whole project. So yeah, it's a good idea. Sounds good. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, let me know uh, as far as planning ahead or what's the next, uh, as far as uh, the curriculum or what we need to do uh, before we are done. Uh, if you have any need in any area, we can work also uh, to cover that gap or that area as well. Okay, the next part, I think we should just think about what we wanna do next uh, week. Just uh, any suggestion or planning. I think Mulham is raising his hand. Mulham, yeah. yeah Go ahead, Mulham. Say, thank you. Um, because it's the end of the year and there's a lot of rumors uh, for a lot of part of the year about the COVID, I think it's the right time to discuss about the facts about COVID and what is real, what is not, based on pathophysiology and science and evidence-based uh, basis. For instance, the COVID-20 right now, and some are saying COVID-21, some, yeah. COVID-20 plus, COVID-20 pro. So they're kind of playing games. So it is a serious thing. And I think it's important to discuss it. And this is an interesting topic that we can 
be involved as um, multiple team members, two or three, four, and discuss it, and one would present, or even two or three would present it. Because there's a lot of rumors that occur occurred, and there's a lot of understanding about what is the fact, about what is the rumor, and the pathophysiology behind the truth, which prevented from being um, not. And also, there is one interesting thing uh, here I've seen in JAMA Journal last week, the Sun, which is science denial and COVID conspiracy theories. Uh, this is written by Bruce Miller. Uh, I think it's very interesting. He's a neurologist in the University of California. He's speaking about why we are believing or the public is believing false beliefs based on fear. And he explains it based on neurological association. So uh, having this interest to relate it to the words, the facts of what happened during the past year and all those correlations, I don't know. Just this is the thought process at the moment. I would like to hear your uh, thought, Dr. Nader and everyone, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Aza. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, yes, I, I agree with you, Mulham. Uh, this is an important era of, for medicine, and, and nowadays a lot of changes are happening. And we are, uh, I think uh, we need to reflect on that. And I believe that this is history in the making. So we need to have, uh, yeah, we need to, to have a lot of uh, uh, talk about it. And uh, perhaps maybe we don't know something will will come out of it. And uh, uh, I guess you raised an important point about that. I totally agree. Great, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Go ahead, Ali. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, I think this is an important topic and yeah, um, we should discuss that um, and the way uh, Mulham suggested is good, uh, being a team of three or four, um, but my point is I think uh, this is a huge topic and maybe we can delay to the, in two weeks just to perfectionize uh, the job and also I'm interested in that. Uh, if we would present that uh, I'm, I want to be one of one of the of team. Great, thanks, Ali. Anything else? Any other comments? Go ahead, Roa. Um, I totally agree with what Ali said. Uh, I think this is a very good, big project to talk about. So, um, being um, trained on two weeks, so we can like dig it more. Great. So uh, there, I agree with you guys. It's a, an important topic, uh, as Mohan mentioned. Uh, how about if we want to divide the topic for the four teams? Yeah, that will be an interesting way to divide it into the four different teams, but uh, what are the sections or subdivisions that every team would be uh, entitled to speak on? Like a certain, uh, from time to time, for instance, it can be based on the months, for example, from March up to um, close to June, something like that. And second team from June to maybe September or less than that, maybe three months, three months each, maybe less. But that's based on the months. Or is it subdivided based on that fact itself? So I don't know how it can be possible to be subdivided, but it's yeah, it's a big topic really. Yeah, I'm not sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, 
the idea of time, I think, is uh, is good one. Uh, one. One thing we should think about, I was just thinking about uh, the last few days, is uh, the vaccination uh, and uh, misinformation uh, in the media nowadays. Uh, actually, when I came to my in-laws, they were Again, it's hundred percent. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Let's handle it one by one. So uh, I talked about the basics first, and then about the importance of the benefit, and then to make it uh, applicable, I told them uh, some of my uh, colleague are already getting it and. Uh, then the last part is I am going to get it. So it's kind of, I put it then uh, to for them in a layer process. Uh, and finally, they were uh, accepting the fact they can get uh, vaccinated. So um, I think vaccination and uh, misinformation is a bigger part that we can contribute to or uh, we can uh, add to the topic if that doesn't complicate things. Uh, any other suggestions as far as dividing the topic? Go ahead, um, Marwa. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, um, maybe, uh, for example, as we said, like the, the, this like really interesting topic and the, um, the part about the, the COVID-19 itself, the, the disease itself and how people, like people perception, the theories that were like contemplated at the time for, from, from people and what would have been like the, maybe the reason here about this and maybe relate this to a previous um, experience in the past, like previous maybe pandemics or something like this, maybe this part, as you said, the vaccine definitely, and they are like uh, as well um, rumors and uh, theories about this. So like we can present the, actually the facts with like the, what was maybe uh, some people were like uh, maybe trying to convince others about this. And uh, maybe we can add something interesting about unusual presentations of COVID or something like this, if, if you feel like it might be interesting as well. So maybe these are three major areas to, to cover. And if anyone has more suggestions. Thank you, Marwa. Uh, go ahead, Aza. Um, yes, uh, may I suggest something? Um, sure. Let's do that like a, a part of our meeting. Yes, we are doing the, I guess we are doing the interview part. We can like name it COVID update. It will be like taking 15 minutes of each meeting and anybody can assign to it according to their preference. And let's say Mulham is interested in the genetic mutations of the COVID and he will take like 15 minutes of the next meeting talking about that. And the next, and this is just a suggestion, not to split it into groups. And, and uh, what do you think, uh, guys? And what do you think, Ali? Because he's our coordinator. <laughs> so, what do you think of my suggestion? Go ahead, Ali, or anyone. Who's ready? Uh, go ahead. Ali. Yeah. Or Mulham. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marwa and Aza, for the points mentioned. And I think the point you mentioned, Aza, is really good to have the updates um, every couple of every week to be, I don't know. Uh, about it to be tough because there is no updates every couple of weeks. But uh, if we there is like uh, the topic itself subdivided into every week there is something mentioned so everyone knows exactly what is the topic that would be interesting. For instance, COVID itself is really a big topic. Um, if it is the facts about a certain portion uh, of the year, then second portion of the year, third portion of the year, and then um, the vaccine. I think even we can start with the vaccine first because of its importance. 
and if we know very well its importance and that, then we can use that knowledge into our inner circle and larger circle. Um, yeah, it's really a big thing right now and everyone is really afraid of it. For instance, I'll give an example. My brother is vaccinated. He didn't mention to my mom. My mom is uh, very scared about it. And she said, you're never gonna take it up to a year now. He was like, okay, yeah, I will never take it. That's never gonna happen. But yeah, again, he, he knows the importance of it. He couldn't break the, uh, he tried multiple times, but because of the Facebook, WhatsApp and everything, it's becoming very tough really. So we need to have more uh, different ways, different approach to try to break that uh, process. So it's important to, for us to know more, to, have, to know different approach techniques and different yeah, mechanisms so we can help everyone we can help. Um, so yeah, so thank you for, for that. And I think as the point is really good that we can actually mention it in a couple of weeks because it's a big topic. Next week it can be, as she said, the mutation part or the vaccine and then accordingly every couple of weeks until we finish the whole points. And um, thank you. Thank you, Mulama and Aza and Marwa. I think Ali was going to uh, add something. So uh, the the there are ways to to handle it as as the the issue is how we can get that uh, beneficial to all of us in uh, an efficient way. Um, getting the topic into one package, like dividing it to teams, it will be uh, doable. Each team will be assigned to uh, let's say by time certain period of. Uh, since the beginning, let's say March, and divide it into uh, maybe three months each. So we'll end up with three teams working on uh, three time period. Maybe the fourth team will work on the other aspect, let's say uh, vaccine uh, and see. So the first team will be about the instance of the infection and the rumors around that, what the theories, what the, and then in the middle, and then in the third part about the new uh, uh, virus that happened uh, recently uh, in UK, for example. And then you can elaborate on that. And uh, the last team will discuss about the uh, rumors about the vaccine and how we can handle that uh, from our perspective, like how can we uh, handle the misinformation that's you know, going on in the Facebook or WhatsApp or other uh, media. Does so that make, uh, Sumi, you want to add something? Yeah, I think the vaccine, you know, the mistrust, that's mm -hmm. a big thing that uh, people is still was not able to accept the data mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, I mean, not accept the data, not able to accept the fact uh, that it is, you know, the efficacy of the vaccine is 100%. And also other, so we have to build on, build the trust of the community or whoever, whatever, same thing like, you know, it is, Although I have uh, so many family members from, uh, you know, like scientists and physician, still they are still able to not able to accept that this is a this vaccine vaccine is very efficacious. Uh, instead, they are thinking about allergic reaction, immune hypersensitivity, those things. So uh, it is going on, going on, and also I felt like, uh, you know, in in uh, as we are in US. Uh, there are some group of population, uh, you know, like they have they have a long term mistrust for the vaccine. Not only COVID, uh, you know, even it's hard to get vaccinated people, even flu or pneumonia or just a vac, something like that. So it cannot be possible in a day. Uh, it will gradually improve, but we have to try our best. Even in the healthcare workers, uh, in my institution. 
uh, although it will be um, you know the people uh, if if they offer the vaccine not everybody is uh, you know still ready to get the vaccine because some of them are saying we are in the childbearing age uh, as i i have contact with you know so many female uh, physicians and then you know they said no we don't have much data about it so we are not we don't want to risk our life uh, as covid mortality is so low so you know they're saying instead of uh, if we have covid there is a treatment so <laughs> we will not get vaccinated so i i think we it is an interesting topic but um uh, yeah it's it's i think it's bad it's good like all of us we can uh, you know if if we discuss about it we'll also read about it more than usual so we'll we'll learn and uh, and it is it is uh, you know we need to know for our, ourselves for the community for our family so it's a mandatory thing so it's better to go by that uh, in couple months i guess Um, great, thank you so much. So um, my thinking is uh, let's handle it as teams and in the future, maybe we can give uh, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes about if there is an update, uh, anyone can jump in about uh, whatever they think and this is the update uh, at that point. Uh, as you said, it's just, uh, rapidly going, changing uh, every now and then something new happens. Uh, we can keep an eye on that. Uh, but for the next week, if we can divide and uh, present something. Uh, so maybe the first team, they can work on getting the, uh, maybe the three first months about the misinformation or the rumors about the whole uh, disease itself. The second part will talk about the, uh, between the three months after like July to September, somewhere October, where the changes in development of the uh, improvement in the disease uh, control um, lowering the curve or uh, in improving the outcome for the vaccine. And then the third part about the new uh, emergence of the new uh, virus in UK and what's the details about that. And the last team will talk about maybe the rumors of the misinformation about the vaccine and how we can handle that. Uh, it's a big topic. If we can handle it, each team, uh, you can contribute as much as you can. Uh, and then we'll see how it goes. In the future, in, in our meeting, uh, each one of you can uh, send me uh, like uh, in advance some notes that I want to talk about genetic, about whatever uh, this topic. So we will assign that person maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes to uh, give us the update uh, instead of uh, getting uh, time for that just every time. I think it depends on the update and how active you uh, import or read about the topics. Does that make sense to all of you guys or do you have any suggestions otherwise? See, as I agree, anyone else? You can use the reaction down at the bottom if you want to agree, disagree, or something like that. So I see two person as okay, do Baba. Okay. Anything else, any addition, any comments, any other questions? So just to finalize each uh, team leader, 
is assigned to ask their team about the project uh, if anyone wants to get involved uh, please assign yourself uh, to uh, at least one project and then uh, if you can uh, the team leader let me uh, give me a list with the members and their uh, assigned or selected project then we will discuss with the project leaders about the team and then each um, project team they will assign task according to what they want to do as a team uh, and hopefully we can handle that as task and then the project will be uh, finished hopefully in time uh, we can work on changing our approach to the abstract so that we can think about submitting it to uh, different entities one of them is AGS and I think there is one for Alzheimer's also there is a meeting coming for Alzheimer's and dementia so we can also think about that uh, the third part is uh, each team is assigned to present something about the COVID in general uh, misinformation and the new virus in UK and so forth any other comments, questions, or suggestions before we end this meeting? All right. Uh, <coughs> like, doctor? Yes, Ali, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, so just to clarify our next meeting agenda, it will be a presentation for the first three months of uh, uh, COVID until uh, July, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments, addition? All right. Thank you, everyone, and I wish you all the best. I wish you good luck and uh, have. Have a wonderful, uh, Lubaba, you want to add something? No, I just want to say have a good weekend. <laughs> have a good weekend. Happy, New Year. <laughs> Happy holidays to those Happy who, holidays. everyone, uh, I wish you all the best and enjoy your rest of the day and the week. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. See you next week. Thank you. See Bye. you next, next year, actually, next everyone. Year. Yeah. <laughs> See you next year. <laughs> yeah. You have a good year. one. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Everyone. Happy New Year. Bye. 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 Bye.